fact, I would ask a question. I didn't ask this last night. It's a question only for the men. How many of you, when you were young, when you men were young, how many of you were taught by a woman? Hold up your hand if you were taught by a woman. I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, women, women take the lead in teaching children, and that's the way it should be. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, you remember the story of Lois and Eunice. But women do so much more. Listen, when there's a shut-in, when meals need to be taken to someone who's been sick, who takes the lead in that? It's women who take the lead. And uh, maybe there's a woman who gets on the phone and she calls four or five of the ladies in the church and say, we've got to work a meal plan for the next week or so. So I just tried to emphasize that leadership is for saints. And I'm glad we've got women here in this series. We talked about how leadership requires sight. That is, you've got to see the need. You've got to see the need to step out. And we, we use the case of Nehemiah, who saw farther than others, all the, even though there was Persia. He saw the place of, of, of Jerusalem in the plan of God. He saw more than others. He saw what could be done in rebuilding the walls of the city, and he saw before others did. Uh, you've got all that lesson in your workbook, but then we close that lesson by looking at leadership is servantship. That, we, that is, we need to be servants, and we'll do more today to define what leadership is. And then in our next part last night, we talked about what leaders need to know about cultural change. Our our culture is changing, and it is changing rapidly. This is not the same America that we had in 2008, and it's certainly not the same America we had in 1980. Things are changing, and I gave you 14 points last night in regard to cultural trends. Increased prosperity. We have more money than ever, and that changes people. Money changes people. It gives us options to do a lot of things, and as a result of our increased prosperity, attendance is falling off in churches across America. More focus on kids' activities, which takes us away from services again. More travel and vacation, which takes us away from services again. One of the things we pointed out last night was the fact that church attendance across the board is, is declining. America is changing. We're not the we're not the people we were in 1956 where everybody got up on Sunday morning and everybody went to church. It's just not that way any longer. And what I've tried to do in this lesson is to show you some of the reasons for that. We're a people of divided allegiance. That is, we're not, uh, you know, we've got... We've got some spiritual thoughts, but we're also chasing after materialism. And we talked about what Jesus said about that in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. We see a changed family makeup. We pointed out that more than 50% of boys in America today are being raised in homes without their natural father. And do not think that has no impact on our culture. It's a radical impact in our culture, and uh, we live in what what one author called fatherless America. So many boys do not have a father figure in their home. And there are other things that impact that too. But here's a really big one. The online options are available on your smartphone, on your tablet, on your computer, uh, even on your smart TV now. You can, you can pull up uh, any, almost anything you want on a smart TV. The online options, more and more churches have uh, an online presence, and we'll talk more about that this morning. They stream their services. Are we being streamed today, Jim? Yeah, we're being streamed right now. This is something that churches are doing just kind of as a matter-of-fact thing today. And some people think, well, streaming is not a very good idea because it gives people the option to stay home and not show up. And that's, again, one of the reasons that church attendance is falling because of the online options. And someone says, well, let's quit doing it then. Okay, you quit doing it, but 5,000 other churches are already doing it, and so the options are still there whether you do it or not. It's not going away. And then we live in a time where there's lack of Bible knowledge. Today's Christian does not know as much as a Christian of 30 or 40 years ago. And it's, a, it's rare to find an exception to that today. And that creates problems for us. And we'll see some 
problems today. There's also a lot of, uh, there's a decline, I think, in conviction. Americans don't have much conviction today about things. In fact, if you have very much conviction about the Bible, you believe the Bible is literally the Word of God and that we must live by these standards, you're liable to be roundly criticized in our culture today. And uh, But there's not much in the way of conviction among Americans. This is culture-wide. Lack of Bible knowledge, culture-wide. Uh, it's just the way things are today. And then we've also experienced something in the past 15 to 20 years, the cultural disappearance of guilt. Hardly anyone feels guilty about anything anymore. It's okay for you to believe whatever you want to do, whatever you want to believe, and do what you want to do, and you can certainly see that in regard to homosexuality. Why, why did the homosexuals used to stay in the closet? It's because they, they would be embarrassed if people found out how they were living their lives. But now, they're proud to come out. And we have politicians at the very top who say, you've shown great courage by coming out of the closet and things like that. We don't have guilt about hardly anything any longer. And then there is self-directed spirituality, and we do that because of Google. Uh, I, I commented last night that if, you're, if your little baby or your boy or your girl is sick, uh, you Google the symptoms and you say, and Google comes up with these answers. Okay, here's probably the, de the deal. And you look at it and you say, okay, uh, we need to go to the doctor. And you go to the doctor and say, Doc, I've already Googled the symptoms. Uh, I know what's wrong with little Johnny and he probably needs this medication. Well, what's a doctor for if you can do, do it all yourself? But see, that, that's what we do with medicine. It's what we do with our investments. And it's what we do with spirituality. People go online. They get lessons online. They learn a lot. Some of it's good. Some of it's bad. But people are directing their own spirituality, just like self-directed medicine, self-directed investing. And then we, we talked about the failure that people have to see the benefit of attending. You know, I go, I get my ticket punched, and I go home. I didn't get anything out of it. We can't have services like that. We cannot. We've got to do better. And sometimes pay, people don't see the benefit because there's not much benefit there. People are just expected to be there. And if that's all your expectations are, you just expect people to come. After a while, they're not going to come. And that's one of the reasons that church attendance is declining across the board. Uh, there's also the issue of attendance versus engagement. People have to be engaged. They have to be involved, not just showing up, but they have to be involved in the work and the functioning of a local congregation. And there's more about that in our book, and uh, in our lesson today, we'll cover some more about that too. We've seen this massive technology shift, and much of what I'm going to say in the second session, or the, the, the next part of our lesson this morning, is about technology and how we deal with the online options, how we get people to come to services in spite of all the, uh, the technical uh, digital revolution that we've seen. Then we spent a little time last night talking about high-maintenance saints. We live in a time when people have got more personal problems than, than probably ever before. Uh, I have served as an elder for more than 30 years. I talk to elderships across the country, from Florida to California. I've worked with churches in, all over and in between in the past couple of years. And I hear elders telling me, Brother Dawson, I don't know what's happening in our congregation. We've got more marriage problems than ever. We've got, we've got our teenage boys who are addicted to pornography. And we've got financial problems. Our, our people are deep in debt and can't pay their bills and they expect the church to bail them out. I mean, you put all those things together, there are more issues than ever before. And so I call those high-maintenance Christians that they require a lot of hand-holding and, and a lot of help and assistance along the way. Well, there is help and assistance for those people, but this is just some of what we face. Look, our culture has more marriage problems, so we're going to have more in our congregation. Our culture has more financial problems, even though we're richer than we've ever been, but we're going to have those problems. Whatever you see out in the culture, it's going to show up in the local church. And we, we suggested this as a possible answer last night, Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So leaders have got to address these issues. Now, I want to go to our lesson for this morning, what we've got to do about the cultural change. Everybody agrees that we've got problems in our culture, but what do we do about it?
And one of the things that I do, and by the way, we're going to be on page 11 this morning of your work, of your little workbook, page 11. Uh, everywhere I go, I talk to elders, preachers, deacons. Uh, everyone is experiencing the same thing. People who attend church are attending church less often. And the online church, the digital revolution is part of the reason for that. People who used to show up three times a week now show up once or twice. And people who used to show up three times a month show up once a month. And people who used to show up at Christmas and Easter, they probably quit entirely. That's just what happens. And this is happening in all kinds of churches, churches of all size. The only exception that I've seen to that are the very small congregations that have 15, 20, 25 people. And it's because typically in those really small congregations, the commitment level to the group is high, and they uh, everyone knows I have to be there because they're not going to make it without me. We need to stick together. Now, that's the exception, but uh, as a church gets larger, there tends to be, the attendance tends to drop off more and more and more, and we ought not to just sit still for that. We've got to fight against it. The question is, how do we do that? Leaders can rant and rave. We can get mad. We can say, oh, people ought to be here. They ought to show up. Well, you know what? If when people do show up, all we do is tell them how bad they're doing, they're less likely to show up next time. I remember an elder, this has been several years ago, I was preaching I was preaching in uh, Orange, Texas, about 30 miles from where I currently live, and uh, one of the elders got up on uh, Tuesday night, and he said, brethren, just look around at this crowd tonight. Look at all the empty seats. This is terrible. We're doing awful here. Well, brother, you're spanking the wrong kids. These are the ones who showed up. Okay, and so if you just tell people how bad the church is and how awful things are, don't expect them to do better. Uh, people do not respond to guilt in the way they used to. You can get up on Sunday morning and you can say, now everybody should be back here Sunday night, and if you, if you don't show up, you're not really a disciple of Jesus, and you can go on and on about that, but people don't respond to guilt in the way that they used to. And if you're trying to guilt people into coming to church, ironically, your attendance will probably drop more. And that's just a fact. The fact is that fewer and fewer Americans, every year the number goes down of those who feel guilty if they miss a Sunday. People don't have the natural instinct that they used to have to head to a worship service on Sunday. Uh, there were people that used to be People would miss church only when they couldn't get there. And now there's so many things that compete for their time and their schedule. And not only that, but there are fewer and fewer people who are part of a local church of any time. I commented to you last night that surveys have shown, and you can see this with Barna, his surveys, with Pew Research. It doesn't make any difference who you look at. They all show the same thing. Uh, what are you religiously? Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, evangelical, whatever. They may have a list of eight or ten different things. And down at the bottom it says none of the above. That is the one that is on the move. The none of the above. We, America is becoming more and more a country that has an increasing number of nuns. People who have no connection to any kind of religion. And yet strangely, these people, if you ask them, are you religious? They'll say no. Are you spiritual? Oh yes, I'm spiritual. These people may believe in God and may even feel some kind of connection to God. But as far as being part of a local church, uh, America, again, is changing and we need to understand that. So what I'm going to present this morning are seven things that we can do to respond to some of the cultural change. And as I go along, I may pause from time to time and ask you a couple of questions and I'll let you do that. And we'll also do a short Q&A at the end this morning. But what you're going to see is that almost all of these seven things we're going to present, will, they are a good response to the digital revolution. But there are also things that we need to be doing, even if computers and smartphones and the Internet didn't exist. Six out of these thing, seven things we need to be doing anyway. Okay? Here comes the first one. And this, of course, has to do with the digital revolution. We need to create a powerful online presence. You know how people learn about your church today? 
How do people learn about the Cortland Avenue Church? They might just happen to be driving down one of the side streets and see Cortland Avenue Church of Christ and say, hey, I think I'll go there. I'm looking for a church. Why not? But that's a very small number that will do that. You know how they used to find out about the Cortland Avenue Church? 1976, one of the best years this church had. We had a little what was called a, a business card in the yellow pages here in, in, in Kokomo. And we were in the upper right-hand corner. When you turn to the churches in the yellow pages, upper right-hand corner, Cortland Avenue Church of Christ. And that was one of the first churches you saw in the yellow pages. And we made contacts because of the yellow pages. In fact, that year, 1976, I was nicknamed Marion Max. I don't mean marrying like the city, I mean marrying Max. Because people who had no church, they wanted to get married, they turned to the yellow pages, look up a church, and there we were. And people would call me. I did, I did all kinds of weddings that year. Always required people to have a little bit of counseling before they got married. But yellow pages, that's how people found out about a church. Nobody today does that. In fact, do you even have a directory with yellow pages? A lot of cities don't even have that any longer. People learn about your church via your online presence, your web page. Now, there are some brethren, and I, I know this is going to happen. This is the first time I've presented this lesson, by the way. But I know it's going to happen. I hope it doesn't happen here. But it will happen somewhere this year where I, where I will present this. There are people that will say, what do we need a web page for? Why do we need online presence? We didn't do that in, in 1990. We didn't have it then. We didn't have this back in the 1950s. Well, it's not 1990 any longer. It's not 1950 any longer. We've been out of the 90s for 18 years. And the fact that we didn't have a web page in the past doesn't mean we don't need, need one now. We live in the now with the conditions that now brings. I'm reminded of what Paul said in... Uh, I lost my Bible. Here it is. In uh, Acts chapter 20, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 20, and this is a verse that, that we use often. Paul said, I kept back nothing that was helpful, uh, but I proclaimed the gospel to you and I taught you publicly and from house to house. What does that mean, publicly and from house to house? Well, Paul took advantage of whatever forms were available. He taught people from house to house. He went here, had to study there, here, and had to study there. But he also had public forums. We need to use whatever forums we have in order to reach people. And that's the purpose. That's the purpose for having a powerful online presence. Let me tell you that you have to have a website just to keep from losing ground. A website's not going to gain you very much by itself, but at least it'll help bring you up to maybe a minimum standard. I did a, a, a leadership meeting three weeks ago in Palestine, Texas, and I told those brethren, you've got to have a website. Do you have one? No, we don't have a website. You have to have a website. It's how people will learn about you. And that's just the way things are today. Everyone else has one, and if you don't, you start off behind. But it's more than a website. It is a, a, a web page is really critical. And on that web page, there's some minimum stuff that ought to be there. Obviously, the times of your services should be there, directions how to find the church building, and a little bit, not a long thesis, but a little bit about what the church is about. Here's, here's some of the things we believe. Here's some of the things we practice. And something that can be read in a minute to minute and a half that just tells a little bit about who and what you are. You have to do something like that. And, but beyond the web page, there, there's more. You can stay connected with people and make connections with people through Facebook. You have a Facebook page? Almost every church now has a Facebook page, but that's not the same as having a web page. You need both. We did a singing last Friday night, and uh, we could go last night. It's our annual singing. We do it the first Friday of May every year. And we, we stream our services, and we streamed that singing. And we streamed it via a thing called Livestream.com. We streamed it via Facebook. Facebook, last Friday night, we had 950 people who watched our singing 
online. 950, just think of that number. Uh, that's, what, that's what an online presence can do for you. So you've got to have a Facebook page. You need someone to monitor a Twitter account for the church. Uh, someone uh, that monitors an email account for the church. I use something, and some of you, I think, subscribe to this. It's, uh, it's called uh, Constant Contact. Constant Contact is an email service. I put out two emails a week. Uh, it's proprietary. It uses their software. I will go online tonight or tomorrow night, and I will write Max's Monday Musings. And then come Thursday, it's Max's Thursday Thoughts. Now, there's a couple of reasons for doing that. One is that it keeps me in contact with our own members of, uh, at Dallin Road Church. Two, it it extends the reach of our congregation. When visitors come and we give them an option to sign up for that email, it doesn't cost anything. And as far as the church goes, it does cost us. It costs us $20, $21 a month, I think. And it maintains our mailing list. And it will even show me who's opening the emails and who's not, okay? Who's, who's just throwing them away. So I get a lot of information. But that's one of the ways you stay in touch with people. Podcast. You know, podcast listening to something on audio how many years ago was it that we got the little cassette tapes and we had these little sony things that we'd tie on our belt and we'd go for a walk and we'd put the headsets on that's old technology but it is making a comeback now with the podcast you can download someone's lesson and uh, you can listen to it while you're driving your car. Uh, you don't get the cassette tape any longer because now it's all just digital and you have it on your smartphone or whatever uh, kind of equipment you're using. But the podcast is something that is making a real impact today and churches need to have something like that. You can take lessons like we're doing this morning and you can Make a podcast out of those. You can also do a church blog where you just kind of, someone just writes little stories about the congregation. You have that as part of your website. And then there's a new thing now called the church app. And I don't know if you guys have uh, this or if you've seen it or not. We don't have it yet, but it's something that we would like to have. The church app is one that's Cortland Avenue Church of Christ and on your smartphone. Cortland Avenue Church of Christ, you hit it. And it... It gives you information, not just throughout times of services, because you already know that. But here are events that are coming up. That's on your church app. Your church app can send out a message to everyone. Uh, just Google church church app, and there, there are companies all over the, the country that will provide those for you. And then there's a powerful online church program called Congregate. Do you all use Congregate here? Are you familiar with Congregate? Anybody? Uh, Congregate is a great program. Uh, it does a lot for you. It tracks your membership. You can print out a simple church directory in, a, in just a few seconds from Congregate. Uh, it, it just affords you all kinds of ways to contact and track your members and guests. Now someone says, well, Max, all this online stuff sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, it is. And nobody said that leadership was going to be easy. It requires work. And so let's be, thinking about, let's be thinking about what we can do to create a powerful online presence. Uh, you know, we might complain about the streaming services that are out there, and you can watch church online now, and you can learn lessons online. We can complain about that. But instead of complaining, we need to take these things and leverage them to our advantage. And, any, any question or observation about creating a, so, a solid online presence? Yeah, Randy? Well, First of all, like your website, uh, we have our website, our members section is protected. You have to, that's password protected. So the only 
phone numbers you can get from our website is the church phone number and the church address when someone just stumbles across or is looking for a, a congregation the only information they're going to get is our contact information but the the church membership directory that is online is is protected you have to have a username and a password and uh, we allow only our own people uh, to have access to that. Former members who've moved away, they're blocked. They can't get on our, they can get on our website, but they can't get in the member section. So you're protecting people's privacy in, in that way. Okay, yeah, Randy's question is about giant corporations that get hacked. Well, the giant corporations have lots of money and various other things. People want to hack them. There are not many people that want to hack Dallin Road Church. Uh, and so uh, I suppose with uh, the right kind of software, someone could get into our member section, but there, we've never had any issue like that. And, and the, here's another fact. Privacy no longer exists in our culture. We need to realize that and live with that fact. But we need, still need to protect our people with, uh, with a uh, password-protected uh, member section on our website. And we have Congregate. That's all protected. Everything we do, uh, my email, Constant Contact, that's all protected. People can't just get into that and get those email addresses. But, but in the bigger sense in our culture, people, uh, our privacy is gone to some degree. If you have a phone that has Google on it, and unless you turn the location services off, Google knows everywhere you go. Google knows where I am right now. In fact, when I walked in the church building a while ago and turned my phone off, uh, it said, uh, do you want to send some pictures of Cortland Avenue Church of Christ? Cortland Avenue Church of Christ is trending right now. And you know why Cortland Avenue Church of Christ is trending? Do you know why? Because a bunch of you came here last night, and they saw you on your way here this morning. They were tracking you as you were driving down the street. And all that's happening with Google. And so, you know, privacy is, we don't have the privacy we once had. Bruce, did you have a question, sir? <clears throat> More of a comment. Um, if, if we go someplace, Kathy and I to go visit a congregation or stay in a hotel, we always go online to get information about it before we get there. We've had several, we've got new members at Woodland Hills and have had visitors that came because of checking us out first to find out before they walked in the door not knowing what was there. So it's, it, it's been a way to introduce ourselves. To Practical experience shows the value of the powerful online presence. Lee and I, we've, we've traveled from one end of the country to the other in the last year, and uh, we, always, we always find a church in advance. And you can go to findthechurch.com. You can start there. Or you can just Google the name of a city and Church of Christ, and you'll find something. So the online presence is a given. You have to have that. Uh, let me go to my second point today uh, about how we respond to cultural change. You know, the Internet is very impersonal. I commented last night that someone may have 500 Facebook friends and zero intimate friends. We need to elevate personal relationships. In the early church, personal relationships were critical to their well-being. Remember in Acts chapter 2, toward the end of the chapter, right after the church had been established in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 44, it says, Now all who believed were together and had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now watch verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Can you see here that these people, these early Christians, spent a lot of time with one another outside of their worship assembly? They were eating their meals together. This was an expression of the relationships that they had. From day one, the, the, the brethren seemed to establish loving relationships that was critical to them. Uh, in Acts chapter 4, I, I sometimes hear people say, oh, I'd never want to be in, that, in, a, in a church like Jerusalem church. You know, big, there were 3,000 people. And Acts chapter 4 and verse 4, the number had grown to more than 5,000 men, not counting the women. 
That's cold and impersonal. Who'd want to be a part of a group like that? You know, you need to be mighty careful before you brand a large congregation as cold and impersonal. You better be mighty careful because you've just condemned the Jerusalem church. And if you look in your Bible in Acts 4, 32, Acts 4, verse 32, it says the multitude of those who believed, that's the Jerusalem church, the multitude of those who, be, who believed were of one heart and one soul, neither did anyone say the things that he possessed was his own. These people were bound together. And one of the reasons they were bound together is that they had these powerful personal relationships. This is more, folks. This is more than just showing up and getting your ticket punched. Producing powerful relationships is something that requires an in-person kind of situation. It's one of the ways that you overcome and address the cultural changes taking place. You see, we've been talking about how fewer people are committed to coming to services. But the more you elevate personal relationships among Christians, the more likely they are to be present. You want to be with the people you love most. This is not rocket science. And so you need to elevate the idea of the personal relationships. Churches that have a high value on personal relationships, they tend to attract people who value personal connections. Now let me ask you a question. Who in our culture today values personal connections? Well, maybe we should ask it this way. Who doesn't? Almost everybody needs, wants, and needs, and longs for real personal connections. And part of our problem today, you know, we have all this connection to technology. And we talked last night about separation anxiety. I feel funny here because I don't have my phone on my hip right now. You know, it's, it's, it belongs there. That's part of me. When I go out, when I go out, uh, out of my house in the morning, get in my car, I feel my billfold back here, and then I feel my phone. I've got to help, make sure all these things are in place before I leave the house. And if I forget my phone and get to the office, I have to leave the office, go back home, get my phone. I live by that phone. You live by your phone. We're connected to technology. It's not just the smartphone, but it's our computer and it's other technological things we have. But in spite of that, we still long for personal connection. In fact, the more we're wedded to technology, the more we're connected to technology, the more we're disconnected from people. And people still long for that personal connection, so we've got to work on that. And so we have to facilitate personal connections. And, uh, and not, just, not just brethren eating together from time to time. You know, it's uh, been a practice for years here at Cortland Avenue Church to go down here to the park, to the little uh, pavilion or whatever it's called down there, and have a, a potluck dinner on, on a Sunday, and that's great. But there needs to be more than just an occasional meal like that. Uh, we at home are now using what we call a small groups program. Uh, some call them the care groups, things like that. This is where everyone in the church is potentially connected to others through small groups. And there are plenty of resources online. Just go online and type in small groups for churches, and you'll get all kinds of information how to set up something like that. Here's the point. Leaders who elevate personal relationships, they are working to overcome the disconnection that we've got in our culture because of technology. We can overcome some of the cultural change. And then as part of that, love people. This is a way we respond to cultural change. We love people in the church and out of the church. If we're called upon to do anything as Christians, it's to love people. That's what God did. That's what Jesus did. God so loved the world. Leaders work to create a culture of love in a local church. And that means you ought to love the people that you worship with. We love one another. And we love the prodigal who needs to come home. But some churches don't do very well at that. They're not very good at loving others. They're not very good at loving each other in the local church. I was preaching up in East Texas a few years ago, and there was a lady who came forward in the service, and she, she wanted prayer. She said, I've just felt like I'm so alone. I'm disconnected from everybody, and, you know, I haven't been doing well as a Christian. I, I just need help. And the preacher got up and talked about this sister, and, you know, we, we want to encourage her, and we'll pray for her, and, you know, she needs relationships in the church, loving relationship. And that was all good. And then we had the dismissal prayer. 
And you know what everybody did? They're gone. This sister is looking for connection in the local church, and she's not getting it. And the people there didn't, they didn't get it. By that, I mean they didn't understand what, what she had come forward for. Uh, love, you know, we can say we love each other. Uh, what is the song we sing, love one another? We sing songs like that, but it needs to be real. And according to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 18, it's not enough to love in word. We've got to love in deed and in truth. Love has to be expressed in action. And you, again, this is one of the ways... It goes back to elevating personal relationships. It's hard to express love in a consistent way without being together. You need to be with the people you love. Human relationships go to their deepest level in person. It happens in person, not online. While you may learn about a church online, and you may want to go and attend a church because of what you've seen online, uh, Loving people doesn't happen very much online, okay? However, it can start a relationship, can't it? And did you know that, according to Barna, 40% of people marrying today first meet online? We've got three or four couples in our congregation at home, married. Didn't know each other until they met through some kind of online, online dating service or whatever it might have been. I'm not sure which services they were using, but people who meet first online. And so what I'm saying is people can meet you online. They can meet this church online, but they don't stay online, just like those couples that meet online. Somehow, some way, those couples who meet online manage to get together, and they wind up oftentimes getting married. And so they meet in person, they get married. We can meet people through a powerful online presence, and then we love them. Love Fulfillment, the fulfillment of love happens via personal contact. Effective leaders who understand the culture know that, and they leverage that. We've got to value loving people. It's part of a culture that we create in a local church. Have you ever been in a church, whether large or small, and you just walked in and just like, ooh, it was like the place just felt cold? I don't mean the temperature. I mean, you know, you just felt like there's, there's no love here. There's something missing here. Uh, you see that from time to time. Create a culture of love within the local church. And then here's another thing to create, and that is create a wonderful worship service. Our worship services ought to be terrific. You know, someone says, well, I can watch a worship service online. I can hear a sermon. I can hear prayers. I hear the singing. Yeah, you can hear all that, but there's something that happens when you're in. And in the moment, that can never happen online. People need to get something in the assembly by being here with you that they can't get online. Let me ask you, uh, how many of you ever watch a Colts game online? Just three people? A, a Colts game on TV, that's what I mean. Okay, you can watch it online too, through NFL.com, maybe. How many of you would rather be in the moment in the room and be there where the game's going on? When we were here a few years ago, Jeff somehow finagled somebody, got tickets out of someone somewhere, and we went to see the Colts and the Broncos at Sunday night football. We were having a meeting. We preached, preached here at 2 o'clock, and we got down there to Indianapolis. And wow, what a terrific game it was. And uh, got to see Peyton Manning playing for the wrong team, okay, the Denver Broncos. Uh, but it was fun to be there. You want to be there in the room. Can you go online uh, to YouTube and watch uh, Carrie Underwood? Uh, what about Keith Urban? Or, or name your own singer. I don't care who it is. Would you rather watch them in a YouTube video, or would you rather be in the concert hall? See, there's something that happens in the concert hall that doesn't happen on a little tiny cell phone or even your computer screen or even your television screen. Church is more than the sum of its parts. When you come together on the Lord's Day, you've got the preaching, you've got the Lord's Supper, you've got the giving, uh, you've got the prayers, 
all the things that happen, the singing, you've got the human interaction. Even the conversations before and after service, they all combine to produce something that cannot be found online. There's something that happens when you're in the room and in the moment that will not happen when you're online. So this is one of the ways that we combat the online thing where people are gravitating toward that. Uh, what that means is, though, that we need to do this we need to do this upright and we need to we need to have congregations where anything goes doesn't go anymore i mean congregations where people get to do their own thing well you know uh let me give you an example. I was preaching. This is in Arkansas. We're, gonna, we're okay on time. We're going to take a five-minute break also, just very shortly, so, so hang with me. I was in a meeting in Arkansas. Sunday, we had great crowds all day Sunday. Uh, Monday, I told the people Sunday, Monday night's lesson is one your neighbor needs to hear. We had a building a little bit smaller than this. Standing room only Monday night. People were standing around the walls, had chairs down the center aisle. A terrific crowd. The, the preacher was the song leader for Monday night. And he got up and started talking about all the people who were sick in the congregation. And Aunt Sally evidently had gallbladder surgery earlier that day. And he, he said, now, does anybody know what kind of surgery Aunt Sally had? Was it, was it that easy surgery or was it that hard surgery? And what is it they call it where they poke two or three holes in you and go in and take your gallbladder out? Some of you were there at that service, I think, because you've heard announcements just like that at some churches. And then the first song. How many of you know this song, this, the preacher says? There were three hands that went up, and he says, well, uh, look, it's an easy song. You'll learn, it. You'll learn it quickly. What a way to destroy a worship service. You've got all these visitors come, and you're talking about Aunt Sally's gallbladder surgery, and now you're going to lead a song that nobody knows. Our singing ought to be terrific. It's one thing that we do and do well, and we, do, we sing better than any of the denominations do, and people need to be able to come here and see great worship services. Anything goes, doesn't go. Everyone should not get a crack at preaching. Well, let everyone, let all the men in the congregation have a turn at preaching. Why not? Because that's, that's how you keep a group small. A small group will stay small. Everyone does not need a turn at singing. And I know that that's a, a sacred cow, but some people think, well, every man in the church who wants to lead singing ought to get his chance to do it. You look, if you're determined to have your own little group that never reaches anyone outside, fine. Worship, though, needs to be led by competent men who are well-trained and well-prepared to do what they need to do. There's a book I'm going to recommend that everyone needs to get. You can get it pretty cheap. You can order it at Amazon. Do Things Well, The Pursuit of Excellence is edited by Warren Berkeley and David Banning. The first, the first article, 13 articles, the first article is just over-the-top good. It was written by Max, okay? <laughs> Listen, I did my best in writing it. I'm, I'm not much of a writer, but this is good stuff. It will, t it will just talk about how to have the really wonderful worship service. If you have a boring worship service that is not exciting, there's no one being drawn closer to God, uh, oh my, uh, we serve an excellent God. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. That's Psalm 8.1 beginning. And how many other passages talk about the excellent God? Our God is above all things. He deserves our best. The saints of God deserve our best. And there's a lost and dying world out there that deserves better than coming to services and hearing a preacher announce about Aunt Sally's gallbladder surgery. A lost and dying world needs to come and to, to hear a gospel that will draw them unto God. And effective leaders understand the value of a wonderful worship service. And if you're con consistently conducting worship services that are boring, lifeless, and careless, you're not striving for excellence, you've already lost the battle and you don't even know it. And that's a brutally unpleasant truth. But churches are losing because of some of the ways they conduct their worship services. I've got three more things I've got to say, and I'm going to say them quickly. Create a culture of serving. 
online church doesn't provide much in the way of serving opportunities. And we need, we, there's two things we need to create in a local church. Uh, it's, it's what I call the prime directive. The prime directive is to create a culture of evangelism and a culture of serving. That's the dual, our prime, directory has, our prime directive has that, those two concepts, they must become a part of our DNA. Uh, you know, when we think of service, we think of people down at the bottom. You know, people who are in the service industry. They're people who don't, uh, maybe don't have a good education, don't make much money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to the church, service is what we ought to be about. Uh, service in the assembly, service outside the assembly. We'll, t we'll have more to say about that in one of our other lessons upcoming. But that's one of the things that we need to do. And the online church doesn't provide much in the way of serving. Next, we need to prioritize young people. Uh, you do that with young kids and with teens. Churches fail because leaders do not put a priority on young people. Uh, when you have great Bible classes, great devos for kids, uh, for high school, college age, after services on Sunday night, uh, when, you, when you prioritize young people in that way, those kids want to be there. We do uh, every other Sunday night, we have something either for our junior high kids or for uh, high school, college kids at someone's house or at a restaurant. We do devos uh, two or three or four times a month, just depending on, on what other things we've got scheduled. Uh, the home devos are just a really great and important thing. Uh, there's so much to say about that. I'd like, for, I'd like to encourage you to read the rest of that, and we'll say more about young people later on today. I got to finish this last point here. What leaders have got to do to respond to cultural change? You've got to create a culture of peace in the local church. And I, I want to express this point in a positive way if I can. And I'm doing that because the other side of the coin is an ugly, negative, and destructive thing. There are fundamentally four reasons why churches decline in our time. One, they do little or no evangelism. Churches talk evangelism. We talk Great Commission, but it's mostly just talk. Two, we lose 50 to 60 percent of our young people to the world. And we may blame the preacher for that, we blame other people in the church for that, but the fact remains that we're not doing much to save our kids. Thirdly, we fail to realize the cultural changes that are taking place, and because of that we don't know how to respond. In fact, most of the time we don't even know that there's a need to respond. But fourth, here's, here is one that has destroyed souls. Brethren fight and argue and tear each other to pieces and destroy unity. The cause of truth suffers because brethren choose not to get along. Infighting never caused a church to prosper. There's not a single lost soul that has ever Number one, by a, by a church that's having a big squabble. A teenager was never grounded in the faith by a church fight. But many churches have put themselves in a state of decline and cost the souls of thousands. We must create, within our congregations, create a culture of peace. Learn the value of James chapter 3. Let me read that text from James chapter 3. This is how we are going to function in our culture today, folks. James chapter 3, beginning at verse 13, he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. I think James was talking about men's business meetings, okay? We chuckle at that. Why do we chuckle? Because it's more true than we would like to admit. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, and then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, full of good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Seeking peace, leaders create a culture of peace, not an artificial peace that overlooks sin or overlooks error in the congregation, but a genuine peace based on truth, based on the love of Jesus and the love of one another. We must have peace and unity based on truth. 
So much of the infighting that brethren have been engaged in has nothing to do with the truth. It has to do with matters of judgment, matters of personal taste. Listen, I've been around for a long time now. I started off preaching as a young man. I was 20, I guess 26 years old when I started preaching, and now 48 years later, I've seen the harm that is done by the fighting that brethren have done. And disagreements in business meetings. I've even seen, seen fighting among elders in a church. Fighting between deacons and elders in a church. It, it needs to stop. The division that is caused by that. We're going to give account for that on the day of judgment. And I think brethren are blind to the idea that someday each of us is, are going to individually stand before God and God's going to say, why did you do that? Why did you cause so much trouble in your congregation? Yeah, you know, I, I know they didn't, they didn't uh, like the color you suggested for the walls, going to paint the walls. You, you wanted brown, somebody else wanted green. But you were willing to argue and fuss and fight over it for, for three months in men's business meetings. Why did you do that? We're going to give account for all this stuff that we do. We need, to, we need to stop the backbiting, stop the gossip, stop the questioning of motive, stop, stop the judgmental spirit. James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 is a, is a frightening text. It says, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother judges his brother. He speaks evil of the law and judges the law. If, you're, if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? And we've seen men's business meetings over the years where there would be a party spirit where before the men's business meeting, someone already lined up two or three guys for his side and they were going to contend against the other side. That, that kind of stuff needs to come to a halt. Leaders promote a culture of peace. Leaders know when to compromise and when not to. And we can compromise on the color of walls. We can compromise on, on the carpet in the building. We can compromise on a lot of things. We never compromise on truth. But sometimes, brethren, in men's business meetings, they act like, oh, the color of the walls, it's a matter of faith, and it has to be this way, or my family's going to leave if it's not done the way we think it should be done. And maybe they wouldn't do that on the color of the walls, but that's the kind of thing that happens. Listen, we've got to have peace. If we don't have peace, all the other stuff we're doing, it all gets thrown away. Let's take a couple minutes for Q&A. I may have hurt someone's feelings in this last point, and if I did, it's okay, because we need to stop the infighting in local churches. I have seen so many churches divide churches in our area in southeast Texas, divide, and I've not seen a single division over a doctrinal issue, but I've seen churches divide plenty. And it's over matters of judgment and matters of opinion. And people will give account on the last day. I don't think there's a God consciousness there. Question or comment? Max, yes, sir. That's where that love comes in. You know, that bond of love is sound and pure. And it can, uh, yeah. I need, to love, I need to love people, and I need to respect their judgment and their opinion, and not make a big fuss and a fight over something that's a matter of judgment and opinion. It, it's, time, it's time for us to stop doing that. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, there were lots of fights over the liberal conservative issues and institutionalism and all of that. And, and those, those were battles that had to be fought. But sometimes brethren are, are today and have been for the past 30 or 40 years fighting over things they shouldn't be fighting about. Learn to be peaceable. Learn to love others. Be of, a, of a, as much as possible, as much as lies within you, be at peace with all men. Love one another. That's part of the answer. Another question. Rick. Our culture fights about everything. And uh, there, I want to say more about that in a later lesson this morning. You know, there's something interesting, and the next time 
we have a big presidential election and you've seen how divisive our elections have been for the past couple of decades i mean people see the if you if you're a republican and the the democrat over here that sits in a pew on the other side of the building he's kind of your enemy because he's going to vote for the democrat and the democrat looks at the republican the same way we can't have that did you know that two of the apostles of jesus were on the opposite sides you, you had Simon the Zealot, one of the apostles of Jesus. This, the Zealots were those who wanted to overthrow the Roman government. By contrast, you've got Matthew, the tax collector, who works for the Roman government. Can you imagine some of the discussions that these two guys had? But you know what they were able to do? They had to put all that aside. And whatever our views on the Roman government are, We've got something bigger that binds us together. And Matthew and Simon, Matthew the, the tax collector and Simon the zealot, they could hup two, three, four, they could march to the beat of Jesus and do his will because they were involved in saving souls, which is more important than the Roman Empire. And yet they could have clashed constantly, but they had to put that aside and they couldn't bring that into the kingdom. It's just important. We get... Well, there's more we'll say about that later. I saw another hand. Yes, ma'am. You said you've done a series of lessons with several different congregations. I do the leadership. I've been doing the leadership thing for about eight years, but much of what I'm presenting here today is brand new. This lesson I've never presented anywhere. And you've heard, you've heard positive feedback, I'm assuming, from the various places. You know, uh, I, I would say 80% of the feedback is, is really right up there. By contrast... Tomorrow's lessons, uh, surviving and thriving in the 21st century. Uh, I've just started using those lessons about a year or so ago. And there will be a track that we'll talk about that you can engage in individually and that the group will engage in. Here's some things you can do, not only to survive, but to really thrive. And one of the points I'm going to make is that the time to do this stuff is now. We need to act now. Seize the moment. And one church was all, they, they heard those lessons. They said, yes, this is good. We need to move forward. But in a business meeting, two months later, one of the men said, you know, the stuff that Dawson presented, it was all good, but I don't think we should do that now. Instead, why don't we have a study on evangelism, maybe a six-month personal work study, then we'll start doing some of this stuff. And you know what that really said? We're not going to do it. Six-month personal work studies, I'm not opposed to them, but they don't, they don't crank a church up and get people out working. It, it just doesn't happen that way. But about 80% of the response that I'm getting on these lessons on leadership is positive. And I've seen two or three churches in the last year that have actually turned around, that were declining, and now they're doing things differently, and now they've stopped the decline, and they're maybe starting to go back up again. And so these, th these things we're talking about, they're all common sense things. And listen, our next lesson, if I haven't made anyone mad in this lesson, hang on for the next lesson, because lack of proper leadership hinders church growth. One of the reasons that churches are declining is because of the things that the leadership is doing or not doing in some cases. But these lessons, they can, they can make a difference, and they have in a number of churches. Uh, I could identify uh, the Clovis Church out in Fresno, California, doing well. And I've been out there a couple times presenting some of these lessons. Uh, the church where Truex is, Don Truex in Temple Terrace, they're doing extremely well. On evangelism, they're doing extremely well. And it's a result of four simple things that we can do to reach the lost. And I'll talk about that, I think, in one of tomorrow's lessons, those four simple things. You know, it's, it's that way almost everywhere now. Our congregation, people come from 30 miles in every direction to worship at Dallin Road Church. And one of the reasons that people drive past two or three other churches is because, where's my little book? We really strive to do things well. And when people see an active, aggressive church that is getting down and trying to do the will of God and, and be, uh, do it with excellence, people want to be a part of that. 
People don't want to be a part of some boring, dry, nothing happening church and we never plan anything beyond next Sunday morning service. I mean, and, and that's the truth. Some churches, aside from a gospel meeting, have no thought about the future. And when that's the case, those churches decline. There's much more we'll say about that in the course of events. I'll take one more question. Randy, uh, let me go to Yvonne instead. I need you to speak a little louder, Yvonne. There, there's a passage that talks about submitting to one another. you got passages like that. Learning uh, in, a, in a men's business meeting, what better place for men to show submission to one another instead of insisting on my way, let's find a way that, that will please everybody. You know, there's often put up what is called the, um, I, I, I can't think of the name of it, the technical name for it. Well, it's either this or this. We, we only have two options here. Sometimes there's a third option. That will, that will satisfy everybody and everything. And, uh, and yet in a business meeting, we'll set two options out. We've either got to do it this way or that way. And neither way is really acceptable to everybody. Sometimes there's a third option, and we, we look for that third option. Maybe we'll say more about that later. Let's break for five minutes, guys. Break for five minutes. Thank you.